Mariska was usually the person employed to go over to the colonel in Antonio's boat. Sir Hudson styled both Suzarelli and him Sui Campioni as champions. Mariska had two sons whom, as well as Antonio the boatman and his sons, were faithful to Sir Hudson Lowe. About the middle of 1809, Sir Hudson Lowe began to suspect Suzarelli, who in consequence went over to Capri, where he employed his eloquence so effectually as to convince Sir Hudson that he was the most trusty of mankind and wholly devoted to his service. On his return, Suzarelli went to Salicetti, to whom he related the whole conversation that had taken place between them, accompanying it with diverse strokes of wit at the expense of the poor colonel. Salicetti, when he wished to unbend from state affairs and avert himself, used sometimes to send for Suzarelli to make him laugh by recounting the gross manner in which he had humbugged the colonel. Several plans were laid to induce the Prince of Canosa to land on the coast of Naples, but fortunately for himself, he did not agree to any of them, as he would have been seized and shot within 24 hours. While Cesarelli was as carrying on his game, a letter arrived from the police at Paris stating that information had been received that one Cesarelli a Corsican immigrant in the Peg of England was at that moment in Naples, employed as a spy for the English, and desiring that Salicetti might cause him to be arrested, tried by a military commission, and the sentence executed directly. Salicetti sent for Suzarelli, in whose hands he put the letter to read. He then wrote to the police in Paris, explaining the nature of Suzarelli's connection with Sir Hudson Lowe. And though he was a treasure to them, this incident Cesarelli turned to his own advantage as it gave him an opportunity of extracting some money from Sir Hudson Lowe under pretense of having been obliged to bribe, largely some of the police adding that if it had not been for his friend and countryman, Franceschi, who was in the service of Salicetti and had great influence, he should infallibly have been arrested and shot. Information was sent to Salicetti that Cassetti intended to poignard him. Although he did not credit it, he nevertheless determined to take precautions. Accordingly, one night when Cassetti made his appearance, he was seized and minutely searched. Nothing, however, was found upon him to justify such a suspicion. After having gone through this ordeal, he was permitted to enter and loudly complain of the ignoble treatment he had received. Salicetti pretended utter ignorance of it and affected the greatest astonishment, sent for the officer of the gendarmerie, and with an angry air asked how he dared to put such a measure in execution towards a man of honor like Cassetti, the officer who was prepared pretended that it was mistaken by order Salicetti made many apologies to the man of honor. I saw, said Cassetti, who was himself deceived, great rogue as he was, fire flashing Salicetti's eyes with indignation at the unworthy treatment to which I had been exposed. Suzarelli, while over in Sicily, had a conversation with one of the Roncos, a captain of brigands, under the command of one Piccioli, a native of Katy, and in the employ of Queen Caroline, who were in the habit of landing and committing depredations in the Calabrias. Piccioli was tired of her service and was desirous of doing something to procure his pardon and admittance into that of Mira. He therefore proposed through Ronco to cause the gang to land at night in such a part of Calabria as might be agreed upon for the purpose of betraying them into the hands of the Neapolitan police. Suzarelli mentioned this to Salicetti and proposed to send a vessel to bring them to Calabria under pretense of landing in some place where they would meet with a rich booty which plan he hoped to effect through Ronco. Salicetti, however, who doubted Cesarelli's courage, told him that he was clever at making proposals and projects, but not in executing such a one as he had suggested, and sent him away. At this proposal was present one Spatacini, a Neapolitan a lawyer by profession and a secret spy of the interior for Salicetti. Ostensibly, he was a partisan at Queen Caroline's, and in order 
the better to see the partisans of the exiled family. He procured himself to be arrested and thrown into prison by orders of Salad Shetty, where he was detained as a suspected person for four months and apparently treated with great rigor. Although in reality, he was allowed to do what he liked and every night went out of the prison in disguise to make merry with his brother villains. He was a man of determined courage and capable of any desperate enterprise. At night, he returned to Salicetti, to whom he said that the project proposed by Suzarelli was one of straw and that he alone was a person who could succeed as he was intimate with Piccioli, they having been brought up together in college in their houses next to each other. Salicetti promised him success in school in case of success, but if he failed, he declared that he would not only give him anything, but would take his present pension from him, adding that he would give him no money in advance, but would allow six companies of course kitchen Darberry to be placed under his orders. This offer was immediately accepted by Spedicini, who proceeded to Piscara. From whence he sent a messenger to Piccioli, who was in at Riccoli. On Piccioli's arrival, they had a long conference together, during which they arranged their diabolical plans. A few days afterwards, Piccioli landed in the Gulf of Taranto with his gang, consisting of between 70 and 80 ruffians, all uh, Centi de reputazioni, who had signalized themselves by robberies and murders along the coasts and were the terror of the kingdom of Naples. These wretches marched forward to the mountains and in their way took an escort with the contribution of the district for three months, which was in road to the treasury and the Abruzzi. They were led by Piccioli at night into a defile where, under pretense of asserting the way, their Judas proceeded in advance. The Corsican gendarmerie were disposed of amongst the trees, and as soon as Piccioli got to a certain distance, he stepped in among them when they commenced to fire upon the deluded villains and massacred every individual of them who certainly had merited death, but not through the treachery of their leader. After this exploit, Spadaccini and Piccioli returned to Naples, where the former received the reward of his enterprise and the latter his pardon. Salicetti, however, considered his treachery to be of so black and atrocious a nature that he never would see him or allow him to be employed. At the end of October 1808, King Joachim, finding that the possession of Capri by the English was a source of continual annoyance to the trade of Naples, and also being alarmed by the attempted assassination made by persons coming from that island, met in the pay of Queen Carolyn, and considering it as a reproach to him to suffer the English to hold an island so near his capital, determined to make himself master of it. Accordingly, great preparations were made for the attack, which Suzarelli and his confederates persuaded Sir Hudson Lowe was destined for the island of Ponza. Everything having been prepared, a council of ministers was held a short time previous to the attack. Some wished that Suzarelli should continue to deceive Sir Hudson Lowe to the last. One, however, gave his opinion that the success of the attack was uncertain, and should it fail, Colonel Lowe would perceive that he had been deceived by Suzarelli and would never trust him again. He thought, therefore, that to prevent this, it would be right to permit Suzarelli to send information to the real destination of the expedition to Sir Hudson Lowe a few hours before it sailed. Until that moment, Suzarelli should continue to persuade him that it was intended for Ponza. Thus, whatever might be the event, Suzarelli would not be compromised. A number of scaling ladders were requisite for the attack of Capri, and it appeared difficult to cause them to be constructed without its coming to the knowledge of Sir Hudson Lowe, which would not only expose Suzarelli, but point out at once the real object of the expedition. This appeared at first to be an insurmountable difficulty, the genius of the same person, however, who had proposed the above measure, suggested an expedient which perfectly answered. The day before the attack, an order was given by the police that all the lamplighters in the city of Naples should assemble with their ladders. At a certain hour on the following day, the same night, Suzarelli sent over intimation to Lowe that the island was to be attacked next morning, and even it closed him a copy of the proclamation. 
which was to be issued to the troops who were to make the attempt. It was considered that this short notice would only tend to increase the confusion of the garrison. The expedition, consisting of 16 and 1,800 men, under the command of General Lamarck, sailed from the Bay of Naples on the 4th or 5th of October and arrived under the rocks of Capri without any molestation from the English squadron consisting of the Ambuscade frigate and three or four sloops or the flotilla of gunboats, which, in the supposition of Ponza being the intended point of attack, had been sent to defend it. Capri had a garrison composed of the Royal Regiment of Corsica, the Royal Regiment of Malta, and some English artillery. There is not perhaps in the world an island which presents more obstacles by nature to an attacking army than Capri. Nine-tenths of the circumference of the island consist of steep and perpendicular rocks. Several hundred feet above the level of the sea, every known landing place was fortified, and there were about 40 pieces of cannon mounted in the forts. In spite of all these natural and artificial obstacles, the French landed, being obliged in some place to climb the precipices by means of ladders, resting on the moving basis of boats below. The regiment of Malta, whether through cowardice or from having been corrupted by the champion. Suzarelli threw down their arms, refused to fight, and were made prisoners in spite of all the exertions of their officers, several of whom, including the commanding officer, were killed in the attempt. In this manner, the Fort St. Barb and Anna Capri, the summit of the island, were taken. The only way communicating with Capri itself, the citadel and the forts, where Sir Hudson and the rest of the garrison were, was by means of a stair or ladder of four or five hundred steps down which only one person at a time in front could descend and was commanded by several pieces of cannon. Notwithstanding this, the French troops made the attempt, succeeded, and infested the town. 500 men were harnessed to some 24-pounder guns, which they dragged up in one night to Mount Solara, the most elevated point of Anna Capri, and commanding the citadel. During the whole period of this government, Sir Hudson Lowe had neglected to fortify this part in supposition that it was impracticable to drag heavy cannons up the steep sides of the mountain. Breaching batteries were constructed facing the citadel and others furnished with furnaces for red-hot shots erected along the beach in order to keep off the English squadrons and flotilla, which were seen beating up from Ponza. Some reinforcements also pushed off from Naples and landed near Tiberius' bath, and in a few days, Sir Hudson Lowe capitulated, surrendering to the French the island, forts, artillery, ammunition, and stores. Capri was commonly called the Gibraltar of Naples, and the obstacle to its capture or even to landing appeared so insurmountable as to draw forth from Salicetti the following remarks on visiting it after it was taken. J'ai trouvé les Français, mais je ne puis pas croire qu'il y soit en entrée. I found the French, but I didn't think they could get in. When the expedition under Lieutenant General Sir John Stewart and Admiral Fremantle, consisting of about 18 or 19,000 men, left Sicily in 1809, the advice and intentions of the Admiral were that the expedition should land between Portici and Casalamar and attack the city of Naples. Sir Hudson Lowe was with the army. Reference was made to Suzarelli for advice, who recommended that the English should first secure some point of support and retreat by taking the islands of Ischia and Procida, and then to land at Baja, the garrison of which, he said, was commanded by a Corsican colonel, a relation of his, who would, for a certain sum of money, and an equal rank in the English service, betrayed the place after making a show of resistance. That by this time, the English party and that of Ferdinand would have time to arrange their plans to assist them and collect their adherents. This advice was unfortunately followed. There were at this time only 4,000 men in that city, as most of the French troops were upon their march towards Germany. It being a little before the Battle of Vacarum, orders had been given in those troops who were in the city to abandon it if the English landed and retired to Fort St. Elmo, there to remain until they were succored. 
he had even been ordered not to fire upon the town of Naples if the English occupied it, all the treasure, all the king and queen's baggage and jewels were packed up as well as those of the principal persons and ready to depart the moment the English landed. Little or no resistance could have been made. There were several frigates and 74 on the stocks, immense stores between two and 300 sail of merchantmen, and a very large flotilla, which must have been all taken, as Murat did not like to injure the city by attempting a useless defense. When the English first appeared, Salicetti was in Rome. Murat became imbecile and thought of nothing but saving his treasures. The queen, however, who had much more firmness and talent in the cabinet than her husband, sent Cipriani with note to Salicetti entreating him to return without a loss of time to Naples, that the king had lost his senses and was incapable of commanding, and that everything depended upon him. This letter Cipriani concealed in the sole of his boot, and after some difficulty and a narrow escape from robbers near Terracina, succeeded in arriving at Rome. If he succeeded in bringing back Salicetti, he was ordered by the queen to return with all possible celerity, and at a place agreed upon near the entrance of the town to take out his handkerchief and appear to wipe the sweat off his brow. If not, he was to continue his course. He saw Salicetti at about two in the morning, to whom he commuted everything. After reading the letter, Salicetti demanded what Suzarelli and Maresca were doing. Cipriani replied that they were in Naples and endeavoring to persuade the English generals not to land between Portici and Castellamar, but to attack Ischia. Bravo, Suzarelli, exclaimed Salicetti, son perdute. But if they land between Portici and Castellamar, we are lost. Salicetti said Cipriani on who returned with the rapidity never before heard of and made a signal agreed upon. He was soon followed by Salicetti, who on his arrival found Murat's horse's saddle and the king himself in the street, and on the point of abandoning the city to its fate. Salicetti, in rather a harsh manner, told Murat that he was unworthy of a kingdom if he did not defend his people, and concluded by assuring him that he would himself take the direction of everything in the name of the Emperor Napoleon if he did not adopt the necessary measures for defense. Murat confounded, returned to his palace, Orders were instantly dispatched to recall the troops in the interior and those on their march to Germany. The 4th Regiment of Dragoons was brought from the Abruzzi, and every necessary measure instantly adopted. Cannon were placed in the streets with trusty troops and matches lighted, and orders publicly given to fire upon any assailant of the people. Salicetti sent for those whom he suspected and told them that he could not trust to their bare words, that they would remain quiet and not meddle with what was going on, and concluded by asking, in a stern tone of voice, what guarantee they could have they could give him for their conduct. Astonished at his manner, after little hesitation, they asked to be confined in one of the forts until the business was over, which was accordingly done. While he acted publicly in this manner and ordered that every means of defense should be put in practice to encourage those who were faithful and dismay the disaffected, he had at the same time secretly continued the directions that if the English disembarked, the troops were to elevate the town and retire to the forts until a sufficient force had returned from the interior to afford some chance of success. In three days, a respectable force was collected and all fears at an end. Salicetti was a Republican in principle and would have supported the establishment of that sort of government in Italy. Had there appeared a probability of success, he died a few hours after having dined with an enemy to whom he had been reconciled, which gave rise to a supposition that he was poisoned. Upon this, however, there was a difference of opinion, the French physicians asserting that the Italians, denying the facts, no traces of poison were discovered on opening his body. When Napoleon was informed of his death, he exclaimed, Son nom sol, me vale un armée de cent mille hommes. Just his name is worth an army of a hundred thousand men, independent of the confirmation of the above account given to me by one of the then ministers of King Murat. 
and the fact of Sir Hudson Lowe's letters to Susan Fraley, being now in existence, Napoleon, to whom I mentioned some of the circumstances, replied that he was aware of the manner in which we had been betrayed by our spies at Naples, and added that Cipriani, who had been a principal agent, could furnish me with all the particulars. He remarked that, in general, our spies betrayed us, that the French had a great advantage in the Roman Catholic religion, as the spies were induced to believe that it was not only necessary, but even meritorious, not to keep faith with heretics. December 4th, Miss V, a pretty girl, and a femme de chambre, to Lady Lowe, came to long with this day from Plantation House, mounted on one of the governor's horses and furnished with a letter from Major Gorker, stating that Sir Hudson Lowe had forgotten to leave a pass for her before he went to town, and directing Captain Blakeney to admit her, she went to Longwood House, where she remained for nearly two hours, during which time she passed through almost every room in the building. The French domestics were so much enchanted with the apparition of a young and pretty girl that their gallantry could scarcely refuse her anything. She was very desirous of it obtaining admission to Napoleon, and at one time had partly opened the door of the room where he was for the purpose of going into him, but was prevented by Saint-Denis. She persuaded them, however, to allow her to peep at him for some time through the keyhole. The seventh communicated to Mr. Baxter that Napoleon had at last agreed to take some medicine, which I administered to him myself, and by which he had been temporarily benefited. Mr. Baxter agreed with me an opinion of the propriety of affording him some other winter abode than the dreary and exposed situation along with, where, in consequence of the bleak and eternal southeast wind, he was generally contracted a catarrhal affection whenever he went out. Mr. Baxter himself mentioned Rosemary Hall or Colonel Smith as being the most suitable. Ninth, signal made for me to proceed to Plantation House. Soon after my arrival, Sir Hudson Lowe said with a serious air that he had sent for me on business, not medical, that he had great occasion to censure my conduct, and then proceeded to ask if I had not kept up a correspondence or was not the medium of communication for the French at Longwood with persons on the island. I felt surprised at the question and replied that I was ignorant of his meaning. He repeated his interrogations more than once, adding that he did not mean communications to favor General Bonaparte's escape from the island, but of another nature. I replied that if going into shops and buying articles for Countesses Bertrand and Montalon or others at Longwood could be construed into carrying on communications or correspondence for them, I must certainly plead guilty. He then asked if I had not written to town to a person to send up some articles for Madame Bertrand. I replied certainly that I had written to Mr. Darling to send up some basins, chamber utensils, and other articles of household use. The governor said that it was a breach of orders, as he had prohibited me from being the bearer of any message or communication not medical. What business had I to do so? If Madame Bertrand was anything of the kind, let her apply to the orderly officer. And why had she not done so?